morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sam Shimon. And on behalf of the Center for Religious Debate and First Arabic Baptist Church, I would like to welcome you to this debate, Was Muhammad a True Prophet? My position is to keep the debate fair by making sure each side keeps to the time limits given, not to decide who won or lost. <clears throat> the great debate series was designed to give both Christians and Muslims a chance to present or defend their positions on various Islamic and Christian topics. But rather than simply agree to disagree or compromise our faith, as is commonly practiced in interfaith dialogues, our method puts each side's belief, belief system under rigorous scrutiny. Belief statements for each side are not taken at face value. During the debate, every neatly constructed argument will be tested to prove its validity. We believe in tolerance, not intolerance, we believe in tolerance, <clears throat> the historical meaning that we treat the people of other faiths in a fair, objective, <clears throat> and humane way, even if we do not accept each other's beliefs. Our hope is that each of you attending will respect debate in this way. <clears throat> the nature of this debate is that our faiths, Muslims and Christians, will be challenged. Evidence will be presented that may be contrary to what we have been taught. This may be difficult for some. We desire this event to be orderly and conducted in a spirit of historical tolerance. In light of this, the Center of Religious Debate will exercise zero tolerance policy regarding any intentional disrupt disruptions of this event. Now the topic for this morning's debate is, Was Muhammad a True Prophet? <clears throat> The Christian debater to my right is Anthony Rogers, who is a student at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He's an author for AnsweringIslam.org and AnsweringMuslims.com and has participated in several public debates for the Center for Religious Debate Against Muslims. And in my estimation, he's our finest apologist by the grace of God. So <clears throat> we have two men who are qualified to represent their respective positions. And so <clears throat> let me introduce the Muslim debater to my left. His name is Andrew Livingston, a writer for Taqwa magazine, the author of the novel Snatching Shadows, and was a former devout Christian. <clears throat> now with that said, the debate format will have two rounds. The first round being, the Muslim will come up with an opening statement of 33 minutes. The Christian rebuttal will be for 22 minutes, and then the Muslim response will be for 11 minutes. The second round, the Christian will come up with this 33 minute opening statement. The Muslim will rebut that opening statement for 22 minutes and the Christian response will be 11 minutes. Now our sister here is keeping time, correct? Mm -hmm. So with that said, I invite our Muslim speaker to begin his positive <clears throat> presentation. In the name of God, the Lord of the worlds, the most benevolent, the most merciful. A lot to say, so I hope you don't mind if I skip the usual formalities. As Stephen King put it, no one has ever come across a book called 100 Great Introductions of Western Civilization. As you go through the Quranic narratives, you'll find a curious pattern beginning to emerge. A pattern of incidental revision, for want of a better way of put it, briefly putting it. You see, when the Quran gives its own version of a story, which can also be found in an older scripture, it'll always seem to clean up all of the mistakes, it'll take away all the elements that need to go, be it because those elements are blasphemous or slanderous, because they're obvious embellishments or whatever, and yet, somehow this never appears to be an authorial agenda. The point of the text is invariably far away in some other direction. From a, if you're looking at it from a secular point of view, it would appear we're hearing the only version of this story, Muhammad knew, may he be infinitely blessed. Or in any case, he didn't select this particular version of the story in order to improve upon anyone else's. So is it just by some extraordinary coincidence that every single time he happened to do just that? Or could it simply be that he was indeed a real prophet, getting his information from on high as he claimed? Take the angel's visit to the house of Abraham. May he also be infinitely blessed. You know, when they come and announce that he and Sarah are going to have a son after all, in both Surah 11 and Surah 51, it's quite clear that we're seeing just one part, the surahs are what the chapters are called in the Quran, it's quite clear that we're seeing just one part of a series of stories meant to show the reader 
how the lives of past prophets can serve as examples. Moses was sent to Pharaoh and rejected. Hud was sent to his people and rejected. Noah was sent to his people and rejected. Shuei was sent to his people and rejected. Saleh was sent to his people and rejected. And such was also the case with Lot. And just as a prelude to the story of Lot, just to provide context for the important passage, we happen to hear about Abraham and his guests. It's the most incidental thing. May all of these prophets be infinitely blessed. The story itself is roughly the same as it is in Genesis 18. But there is one crucial difference. Here God, may he be infinitely praised, is not shrunk down, anthropomorphized, limited. In fact, he doesn't even appear in person at all. Whereas in Genesis, he strolls into the house in human form, flanked by those two angels, and does lunch with his prophet. Perhaps a case could be made that there's nothing inherently wrong with this. Perhaps. The true problem comes when this most awesome power behind all creation says to himself, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very, great, how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. And he didn't know already. The Quranic version gives us precisely the situation any devout theist would have expected. The angels appear all by themselves, having simply, simply been sent by the all-knowing one whom no one is like unto. Only that couldn't have been the point of the text, as I've explained. It looks more like Muhammad, may he be infinitely blessed, just happened to write down a corrected version of the story without knowing it, let alone intending it. Let's see then if this is a fluke. Consider the case of Surah 37, verses 123 through 130. Reading from Asad's translation, And behold, Elijah too was indeed one of our message bearers, when he spoke thus to his people, Will you not remain conscious of God? Will you, will you invoke Baal and forsake God, the best of artisans? God, your sustainer, and the sustainer of your forebearers of old. But they gave him the lie, and therefore they will most surely be arraigned on judgment day, accepting only those who were God's true servants. And him we that left thus to be remembered among later generations, peace be upon Elijah and his followers. As you can see, nothing here suggests a counter-argument to any alternate tradition. Indeed, if anything, it's exactly the opposite situation. If anything, it looks like the intended audience is contemporary people who know this version of the story already, as opposed to the story in 1 Kings 18. I think that's a chapter in which we meet an Elijah who makes fun of the priests of Baal when they fail to perform a miracle and then has them killed. Still think it's a fluke? Consider the case of Surah 2, verses 58 and 59. And remember the time when we said, Enter this land and eat of its food as you may desire abundantly. But enter the gate humbly and say, Remove thou from us the burden of our sins, whereupon we shall forgive you your sins and shall amply reward the doers of good. But those who were bent on evil doing substituted another saying for that which had been given them. And so we sent down upon those evil doers a plague from heaven and requital for all their iniquity. You'll find this passage which squarely between two descriptions of the actions of Moses may be infinitely blessed. But it's fairly obvious that the references to the Israelites stay in Shittim. I mean, look at the reference to a plague. Yet the passage makes it clear that no one was being punished for anything except these specifically guilty parties. Chapters 25 and 31 of the Book of Numbers, on the other hand, as if that just because some of the Midianites seduced some of the Israelites into idolatry, that meant by divine decree that all of Midian had to be punished, including the male babies. Town after town must be burned to the ground, kill all the young women who aren't virgins, and let the Israelite soldiers keep the rest for themselves. Now, consider what the Quranic passage reveals its purpose to be. It's an odd thought that such an extreme correction would be incidental, yet this would appear to be the case. These verses are part of a very long discourse about how the children of Israel should be thankful for the blessings they've had in the past. There's no tiny intimation of a revisionist bent. But the story of Noah is where this truly gets interesting. Genesis 6 through 9 tells of a highly fallible God who first regrets creating man and then regrets destroying him. There are a number of places where the Quran relates its own story of a perfectly omniscient and infallible deity uses a local flood to destroy only one civilization. And I'm trying to suggest that we're literally talking about two different deities here, don't get me wrong. Never once, though, does the Quran tell the story in a way that looks like it's trying to one-up any previous tradition. Indeed, the recounting in the 11th surah mentions how neither Muhammad himself nor his people knew this tale beforehand. May both Noah and Muhammad be infinitely blessed. That's a pretty bold claim. Tell me, is it still just a fluke? You should be starting to get the picture by now, so let us turn our energies elsewhere. Now, one of the great sticking points between Christians and Muslims is the foretelling of Muhammad in the Bible. May Muhammad be infinitely blessed. I can see why that would be a sensitive issue, but it is something we need to clear up. 
This idea has persisted for century after century that the covenant between God and man endured strictly amongst the Jewish people and no one else. Through the line of Isaac, may God be infinitely praised, may Isaac be infinitely blessed. That this even sounds like it could easily be the ethnocentric pipe dream of some anonymous ancient egotist doesn't seem to impress anybody. It's all right there in black and white, isn't it? Laid out quite clearly in Genesis. Let's apply some simple mathematics. According to Genesis 17, Abraham and Ishmael were circumcised at the same time, the respective ages of 99 and 13. Four chapters later, Isaac is born. Abraham is 100 at the time, which makes Ishmael about 14. Starting with verse 8 of that same chapter, the narrative goes as follows. Isaac is weaned. Sarah sees Hagar playing with her son. Sarah demands that both Hagar and Ishmael be thrown out as she doesn't want that kid to inherit anything along with Isaac. Abraham reluctantly obliges. May all these prophets be infinitely blessed. Here's how the story goes from there, and this is now verbatim. Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. What's wrong with this picture? Have you forgotten that we're talking about a 16-year-old here? You got the 14 years we started out with, and then probably two years or so for Isaac's weaning. I don't know how many ancient cultures there were in which a 16-year-old wasn't considered an adult, let alone a little kid. Yet here Ishmael, may both he and Isaac be infinitely blessed, is called a child who can be held fast with a single hand, who can be lifted up with a single hand. He could be placed on someone's shoulder, and he could be thrown under a bush. A 16-year-old? It doesn't add up, and there's a reason why. You see, what we think of as the Torah was originally several different versions of the Torah. It's just that they were retroactively re-edited into a single document. First people wrote the Yahwist and Elohist texts, more commonly known by the abbreviations J and E. Named after J.H.W.H. and Elohim, two monikers for the deity. May he be infinitely praised. Then you've got the priestly text, or P, called such because it seems to have been written later by a Levitical priest. And most of Deuteronomy had its own author. We call all the stuff he wrote the D text. These four different writings, J, E, P, and D, eventually got spliced together into what we now know as the Torah. Think of it like a modern Hollywood movie script. I don't mean in terms of content, of course, just in terms of the writing process. In a common, if not typical case, a movie studio will have the same script be rewritten over and over again, always by people who are never in the same room with any of the other writers at any time. The analogy isn't perfect, and I hope it wasn't offensive. I'm just trying to get across the basic idea of several different texts by different people getting mixed together into one text. Now you know why our supposedly authentically moses pin Torah contains all those strange past tense references like at that time the Canaanites were in the land, Genesis 12, 6, and never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, Deuteronomy 34, 10. Speaking of which, now you know how it is the supreme being can sit down and eat a meal with one of his prophets, and according to Exodus 33, there was an occasion when a different prophet asked to see his face and was told that he must hide away in a crack in the earth because, quote, no one shall see me and live. Those two stories came from two different authors. The former is from the J text, the latter from the E text. Now you know why chapters 32 and 35 of Genesis offer two different explanations for how Jacob came to be named Israel. May he be infinitely blessed. In one passage, he's fighting a stranger in his tent. In another, he's removing paganism from the land. We're not talking about differing accounts of one event, but it's not the same story at all. Because these passages originally came from two entirely different documents written by different authors. Richard Friedman says in Who Wrote the Bible that the two earliest texts, J and E, might have both been based on a yet earlier writing, now lost. There's also a diagram in Friedman's book showing which of the four texts each passage in our modern day Torah originated from. It's quite eye-opening. In the J text, you see, there is no declaration that the covenant is to reside only with the descendants of Isaac. 
May he be infinitely blessed. This is the closest we get. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. I'm quoting for the New Revised Standard Version. What a perfectly odd thing to say, right there in the midst of words of comfort. There, there, sweetie, let me reassure you with the most wonderful news. Your son's going to grow up to be such a dirty, rotten scoundrel. If anything in any story has ever positively screamed after the fact embellishment, it would be this. And yet, there's still no actual statement here or anywhere in the J text that the Ishmaelites won't share in the covenant. You can't find one in the E text either. What it says is, it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. Take note that it's from E that we get the story of Ishmael getting left in the wild. May he be infinitely blessed. <laughs> And what comes of that, if you'll remember? The promise of a great nation from his descendants. What you don't get from it are discrepancies in people's ages. You need to combine P with E in order for the numbers not to add up, since P is the source of chapter 17. And I imagine that by this point, it's getting pretty confusing. So here's the important thing. It is therefore in P and P alone that we find any promise of the covenant coming strictly through the line of Isaac. May Isaac be infinitely blessed. The P text. It's written much later by a Levitical priest who is concerned with the reputation and regulations of his own kind. Although, fascinatingly, even there we find that other promise, the prophecy that through the Ishmaelites there will come a great nation. If even in P the prophecy survives, what does that tell you? But when did it ever come true? Search through the whole Bible, you won't find it, not there. This thread is still left awkwardly dangling at the very moment the new Jerusalem descends from the sky at the end of Revelation. And the voice from heaven says, it is done. Flash forward a few centuries after the Bible was compiled. Muhammad H. Cattle described in the life of Muhammad, a mecca drenched in debauchery and idol worship, where the only Christians and Jews even allowed to enter could do so merely as servants, never uttering a single peep about their religion in the process. Three guesses who changed all of that. Before the advent of Islam, it was more or less the norm for a Saudi Arabian living in the desert to think that he could get away with most anything just by making an offering to an inanimate lump of wood. Afterward, this was no longer the case. And yet we are talking about a religion based on a text that says, for instance, and it's 109th surah, unto you your religion, and unto me my religion. Now, I know that Anthony is skeptical of Muhammad's descent from Ishmael. May both Muhammad and Ishmael be infinitely blessed, but stop and think. When was the last time you ever heard any Christian dispute the descent of an Arab from the Ishmaelites who wasn't an apologist arguing with Muslims? Even the skeptical Israel Finkelstein and Neil Silverman in the Bible on Earth will take a rigidly secular point of view. Say that Ishmael is described in Genesis as being, quote, the father of many of the Arab tribes who inherited the territories on the southern fringe of Judah, while his sons Abdil and Nebaioth represent North Arabian groups first mentioned in late 8th and 7th century Assyrian inscriptions. The other son, Tima, is, quote, probably linked to the great caravan oasis Tema in northwest Arabia, mentioned in Assyrian and Babylonian sources of the 8th and 6th centuries BCE. It was one of the two major urban centers in North Arabia from circa 600 BCE through the 5th century BCE. As you can see, while the prophecy is unexplainable from any reasonable Christian perspective, it certainly seems to have come to fruition after biblical times. Everything fits. Now, another huge point of contention regards the identity of the Comforter in the book of John. I imagine that this certainly comes as a shock to those Christians who are unfamiliar with the with Christian-Muslim interfaith debate. They're sitting here thinking, wait, what? Surely he doesn't mean what I think he does. It does bear explaining, doesn't it? But I believe I found the key to settling this one as well. It is in Bernard Mueller's explanation for why John is the one non-synoptic gospel. That is to say why it's so different from the first three Gospels in terms of writing style, storyline, and themes. The facts he's uncovered, if you're willing to accept their implications, lead to an astonishing truth. This is going to take a fair amount of time to go over, but you must bear with me. As it turns out, John was originally another synoptic Gospel. 
which means that at first it was based on Mark and more or less followed the Mark and storyline. But apparently, when Luke came out, the text of John was tailored to fit with it. In other words, John was made more like Luke. Soon enough, of course, we got the Book of Acts, and basically the same thing happened all over again. There was another layer of revision. John was influenced by Acts. Even then, it wasn't over. In time, the beloved disciple died, and the text of John got retconned yet again by the addition of an epilogue intended to address the matter of his death. I'm talking about the last chapter. With each of these rewrites, John had been getting more and more distinct from the other Gospels. By now, it was off in its own little world. The book of Matthew, in case you're wondering, it was part of a separate line of tradition from the Luke-Acts one. And so I guess you could say we're in another situation comparable to the one we were in with the Torah, but I'd rather not make that comparison myself. As strange as this theory may sound at first, I think you'll find the more you think about it, the harder it is to deny. This is all best demonstrated by John's ending, or shall I say endings. I can explain the whole thing just by focusing on that. It goes like this. And again, this is, this is the foundation of everything, so I have to explain it. John appears to suffer from a severe case of return of the king syndrome. It's in, it, it just keeps stopping and stopping. Chapter 20 begins with Mary Magdalene coming to the empty tomb and finding the stone already rolled away. How did she know which tomb to visit in the first place? The text of John gives us no explanation for that, but chapter 15 of Mark does. She rushes to tell the apostles what she's seen. Peter and the unidentified disciple whom Jesus loved, it doesn't say it's John, come to the tomb. And then we get the words, then the disciples return to their homes. As Mueller noted, this was probably the book's original ending. It was foreshadowed all the way back in chapter 16, in which Jesus, may he be infinitely blessed, said, The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Before extra verses got added by forgers, Mark likewise ended without any appearances from a risen Christ. You can look that up almost anywhere now. Somewhere maybe around the year 80, the book of Luke came out. Before long, John was no longer based only on Mark. The ending was no exception. In Mark, there's only one figure in the empty tomb, whereas two angels appear in Luke. There are two angels in John as well. The ending at this point is John 20, 23. Notice how that passage begins with a but and makes it seem almost like Mary Magdalene is discovering the tomb a second time. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. It looks kind of tacked on. And all that stuff about the apostles getting scattered, leaving Jesus alone, has now been thrown out. This author's priority was finding a way to squeeze in a parallel with Luke 24. I'm referring to the scene in which Jesus, may he be infinitely blessed, meets up with the apostles after his resurrection. The fish eating, the promise of Pentecost, everything written in the scriptures must be fulfilled. That moment, when the apostles are in a locked room and he materializes out of nowhere. And now what should happen but that the book of Acts comes along to complicate things even further. Have you ever noticed that Acts 1-3 sounds a little like John 20-30? The former tells us, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself alive to his disciples by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The latter reads, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In any event, the text of John could hardly look any more like it was supposed to end with that part. Short of the author throwing in an amen, just listen to how it goes. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. You can almost hear the words the end, but it's yet another fake out. Everything gets abruptly started back up. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Why didn't we hear about that before? Nor was Thomas's absence brought up in Luke 24. In fact, we're explicitly told in Luke 24 that all 11 surviving apostles were present. The true ending, the one we have now, I mean, came about when the beloved disciple died and a 21st chapter got written about it. But I personally strongly suspect that one of the purposes of that may have been to explain to turn of the century era Christians why all of the disciples were dead, at least in a great likelihood, despite what they've been told in previous tradition. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they sing that the kingdom of God has come with power, Mark 9.1. In the Holy Spirit as paraclete, the gift of John's gospel, Raymond Brown proposes that for the Christians of the Johannian community, a belief in an entirely spiritual paraclete, the original Greek term for the comforter, 
was necessary partly to explain why the second coming hadn't already happened. They needed to believe that Jesus did in fact give a speech to his disciples in which he told them that he'd be back before they died, but only in some nebulous abstract sense, because that wouldn't be disproved by the mere passage of time. The text of John suffered various other re-edits at the hands of copyists, but for my purposes now they're unimportant. You may ask why any of these details were important. What do they have to do with the identity of the comforter? But I've given you the answer already. I wonder how many of you caught on. In the earliest version of the text, Pentecost was not a factor at all. By corollary, then, the text had nothing to do with the coming of what Christians now call the Holy Spirit. It was in the second Luke-inspired version of John that we were first presented with a receive the Holy Spirit moment, when Luke 24 got shoehorned in. Think about it this way. Where in the text is influenced by Mark alone, has nothing to do with Luke or Acts, so are you ever going to find any allusions to Pentecost? So since the traditional reading is out, how are we to determine the actual original meaning of the Comforter passages? Now this is where Mueller and I disagree. Jesus, may he be infinitely blessed, does something very interesting during the Last Supper discourse. At the end of John 14, he says that he won't be speaking for much longer. And then he says, rise, let us be on our way. And then he just keeps right on talking. The text continues as if nothing had happened. Mueller says that chapters 13 and 14 must therefore be giving us the earlier, more genuine version of the speech. I call that a jump to conclusions. Long story short, he can't first tell us that the original ending was foreshadowed in chapter 16, and then say that chapter 16 wasn't itself part of the original text. So maybe chapters 15 through 17 actually give us the true version of the speech. It's likelier, though, that this is not actually that simple an issue. There's more to it than that. The Holy Spirit entry in the Oxford Companion to the Bible says that the five paraclete sayings were perhaps a separate collection before their inclusion in the book of John. What that amounts to is that these passages about the Comforter might have predated the rest of the text. Brown, too, explains in the Gospel and Epistles of John, a concise commentary, that the Last Supper discourse appears to contain sayings spoken on many different occasions, instead of it all literally being a single speech. It was just written that way, said, like, like a literary device. It, think of it being the same thing with the Sermon on the Mount. Bear in mind Brown's pervasive inerrantism. The scrutinize of Periclete sayings in particular, and you'll find that what we have before us seems to be at odds with itself. Sometimes the comforter is described in terms that sound human, and sometimes in terms that come across as highly spiritual and abstract. Just listen to how different these two passages are. Chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. Chapter 16, verses 13 through 15 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine, and declare it to you. He will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. Since the earliest form of the text had nothing to do with Pentecost, what can we conclude from this discrepancy? Right, the more human-sounding depiction of the paraclete must have been the original one. And as for the semantics of the term spirit of truth, 1 John 4, 1 makes it clear that at around that time the words spirit and prophet were sometimes used interchangeably. Just look at the very word paraclete itself. The Oxford Bible Commentary says the word parakletos is a verbal adjective often used of one called to help in a law court. In the Jewish tradition, the word was transcribed with Hebrew letters and used for angels, prophets, and the just as advocates before God's court. What's this? Paraclete can be a prophet. That certainly seems to fit, doesn't it? He will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. For all I know, there could have been more than one claimant of prophethood who hosted Christ, said that he had been foretold by him as well, said that he was taking the teachings that had been Christ, may he be infinitely blessed, and giving it to others, and said that he didn't speak on his own, but instead only revealed the messages given to him. But, mind you, I don't know who he would be. So, the evidence can be found in the Old Testament, can be found in the New Testament, 
And you'll find it by applying a sensitive, a sensible reading to the Quran. So pray, how much do you need? You don't want to take the six minutes? No, I don't, I don't need it. Okay. Well, Anthony, uh, your time at the mic for 22 minutes. All right, it's uh, good to be with you. Uh, it's a little awkward for me to be starting a debate by already entering into a rebuttal. Ordinarily, this would be an opportunity for me to give a positive statement, but we're, we decided to do things differently at Andrew's request. Uh, so I do want to give you at least a greeting, and before I jump in here and look like a, a big meanie uh, for, uh, if you will, uh, pouncing on all of that, uh, let me just say at the outset that this debate, the, the topic that we're debating is, was Muhammad a prophet? The one thing that I think is clear from Andrew is that he doesn't believe the Bible as it is, is the Word of God. That much is clear. If we were arguing that today, this would be a very different debate. That would be very relevant. But as it is, it, see, it strikes me as very irrelevant. I'm very much eager to want to defend the Bible, obviously, as a Christian, and I think that a lot of that was, to be frank, pure hokum, and I've studied those issues uh, ad nauseum. I've looked at the documentary hypothesis, JEPD. I've looked at the idea that John's Gospel is a patchwork of various sources that has been reworked and so forth. So I'm not unfamiliar with those issues. But I've got to be honest with you, attacking the Bible uh, at, at length like that, uh, in, in that way, doesn't convince me that Muhammad was a prophet. That's what he was supposed to be arguing. How does telling you that the Old Testament is unreliable, that it's embellished, convince you that Muhammad was a prophet? I wasn't the slightest bit moved here. The slightest bit moved to think that Muhammad was a prophet. I wasn't the slightest bit moved to think that Muhammad was a prophet because John is such a bad patchwork of inconsistent material and themes and threads and so forth. I can't imagine that you were convinced by that either. And I'm not trying to be mean here. It's simply the case that that sort of thing can't infer or bring down the conclusion that a guy in Arabia who obviously contradicted everything that the Jews believed, everything that the Christians believed, I mean there were incidental points of agreement, but the fundamental issues of their religion, Muhammad was at odds with them. And we're supposed to believe that the proof that he's a prophet is? Well, in the story of Abraham, you see, God appears as a human being. That's what he said. He says the story is anthropomorphized. God appears as a human being in the story, but not in the Quran. Well, I got news for my opponent. He may not appear in the Quran in that story, in the story of Abraham, in a human form, but the God of Islam is not a stranger to appearing in a form. In fact, there are plenty of Muslims who, in fact, could have stood up here for me and told my opponent that the God of Islam has human attributes and characteristics, and not just as a matter of voluntary condescension. That is, when in the Bible, God appears in human form, God has condescended to speak with and converse with his creatures. Obviously, in himself, in his essential, eternal, divine nature, God is not a human being and doesn't have a human form. But God, the God of the Bible is able to condescend and enter into those sorts of relations with his creatures, as he does with Abraham in Genesis. And as the New Testament claims he did in a radical way in the incarnation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, the Quran, in many places, uh, tells us that its deity, as part of his essential nature, is, in fact, an anthropomorphic being. This is not a condescension in, in view. The Quran makes no, sen uh, no mention of Allah condescending in this way. But it speaks of Allah having a face, of having hands, of having eyes, of having feet. And these aren't figures of speech. That's the in a temptation of many Muslims is to say, well, even in the Bible you see hands can be used figuratively, and I grant that. Uh, in, in, even it, it speaks of God, uh, uh, Pharaoh and his armies being congealed in the sea at the blast of God's nostrils, right? I don't think God literally has nostrils, and I would approach the Quran assuming that it can use figures of speech the way the Bible does as well. But there are plenty of statements that I know can't be understood figuratively. The Islamic sources won't let us understand them figuratively. For example, in Surah 3875 of the Quran, we're told that the angels are required to bow down to Adam, which, by the way, is shirk. You're not supposed to bow down to anyone, according to Islam, who isn't God. So he's, his prophet wasn't bringing pure monotheism, like he said, and you know, get, taking away the embellishments to the true worship of God. His God tells the angels to bow down to Adam, and Satan refuses to do so. But when Allah comes to Satan to upbraid him for his rebellion, what does Allah say to him? 
He says, how could you refuse to bow down to somebody that I created with my own hands? The stated reason why Adam is supposed to be bowed down to or prostrated to by Satan is because Allah made him with his hands. Now, if that's just a figure of speech, if the stated reason for bowing down to Adam is because he was created with Allah's hands, if that's just a figure of speech for what Allah does in creating things, then you should be bowing down to everything, right? This is being used to distinguish Adam from everything else. And if you look at the Hadith, the Hadith, the traditions of Muhammad, his inspired teachings outside of the Quran, if you look at the Hadith, they tell us that Allah created three things with his own hands, directly. He created three things with his hands. The Torah, he, uh, he wrote the Torah, he created Adam with his own hands, and he planted the Garden of Eden with his own hands. So that's why Adam is so special, you see. And that's why Satan should have prostrated to him. So his, his, his reason for rejecting the Bible and saying that it's embellished and then running off from that and saying that it's a patchwork of you know, all these different documentary sources, J, E, D, and P. I don't remember if he mentioned D and P, but that's part of the entire uh, thesis of the documentary approach. Uh, Jehovistic, Eloistic, uh, Priestly, and Deuteronomy. Those are the supposed four sources that are going into the construction of the Torah. But his reason for rejecting it and getting on that whole track and going down that line and that trajectory was to say the Bible is embellishing. And the Quran is doing away with the embellishments. And one of the examples of what that embellishment included was the anthropomorphic nature of God in the Old Testament. But I just showed you the God of the Quran is an anthropomorphic entity in himself, not as a matter of voluntary condescension. Understand that. When he created Adam, he had hands. Satan was supposed to bow down to him. Well, uh, he complained about other stories. I don't even need to defend these. This is not the debate, uh, the topic that we're debating. Uh, I don't think he read the Bible very well. I know he's impressed with that. It obviously, it convinces him. Fine. Uh, but we're not debating whether or not he is convinced by those things, that the Bible is true. What I want to know now is what can he point me to to believe that Muhammad was a prophet? Why should I care now? He's now told me that the, the God that he believes in was so incapable of protecting his word it got so, because he believes that God originally revealed the Torah. He believes that God originally revealed the Gospel. He just sent, spent 30 minutes attacking both of those. His God was so incapable of protecting that book so that we might look at it with confidence and believe in this guy who's Muhammad, who's supposed to be so great, the greatest person who ever lived. We're supposed to be able to look to it and notice, I mean, and, and Allah just dropped the ball, he fumbled. He said he complained that God in the Bible appears not to be omniscient, right? Didn't he say that? God says, I'm going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and see if uh, everything is at, like the outcry that has come up to heaven. I think that is just an idiom, a figure of speech. He wants to take that literally, okay? Now, so he's saying uh, the God of the Bible is incompetent. That's a proof to him that the God of the Bible is incapable of being God. Okay, then, was his God not omniscient enough to foresee all of these terrible things that people were going to do to his book? Was he not powerful enough to stop them from corrupting his book? Was he not capable enough, I mean, was he not wise enough to foresee all of this so that we could clearly see that this guy in Arabia who came along and told us that we should be practicing pagan rituals, he, all the rituals of Islam were picked up like crumbs off the table from the pagans. All those things, circumambulating the Kaaba, kissing the black stone, those were things pagans did, which the corrupt Bible tells you is an abomination in the sight of God. The corrupt Bible tells you not to worship in an idolatrous fashion. God does not tell them to go to the pagans to get their practices and principles of worship. I'm sorry, this does not leave me convinced. Um, I'm tempted to just leave it here. Andrew didn't take his entire time, but I really don't know. And I don't even agree. I mean, I could say a few more things. I don't even agree with him in his interpretation of the Quran so often. He says it doesn't teach a, a, a universal flood. It certainly teaches a, a universal flood. Um, in fact, I could read some previous verses if you'd like. Uh, actually, that wasn't a major uh, part of Andrew's thing. It was incidental, and I think I've covered the basic point of that. Um, let me just say a few things now about the paraclete, because he made a whole uh, lot of statements there about John. Again, if he did anything, he undermined our confidence in John. I'm not the slightest bit uh, you know, moved by that. I don't think that he has said anything adequate. I'm familiar with the sources. I've read Raymond Brown. I've read the people who advocate that kind of thing. And if you want a rebuttal to that, if, if that's your interest, which isn't our debate topic, if you're interested in that, go read Richard Balcom. Richard Balcom has clearly uh, put the axe to this idea that the, the end chapter is not authentic, is not reliable, and so forth. But that's not our debate. 
Okay, our debate is, was Muhammad a prophet? And what he told us is, you can't trust the Old Testament as it is. You can't trust the New Testament as it is. Uh, and the reason you can't trust it is because God in the Bible is anthropomorphic, like he is in the Quran. So don't trust the Quran. You can't trust the New Testament because... Uh, you know, all of these things going together uh, leave you with uh, the expectation that this person would be very human, then other statements tell you that he would be very uh, spiritual. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, folks. I'm not convinced. Usually, what Muslims will tell us is that the Quran is... In fact, I think this shows you something, if I can be frank here again, uh, and make this my concluding comment in my rebuttal. I think this shows you, honestly, that my opponent does not have confidence in his prophet, and that Muslims don't when they argue this way. Because what is the great proof that Muhammad gave that he was a prophet, that the Quran was Allah's word? That's not the proof you heard today. Muhammad didn't say because the Bible's corrupt. In fact, my view is he taught that the Bible was not corrupt. Okay? In fact, he told Jews and Christians in Surah 1094 to go look. He told Muhammad himself, Allah is supposedly telling Muhammad to go look at the, the previous scriptures to go talk to the Jews and Christians if he's in doubt about the truth of his revelations. Go talk to the Jews. Go talk to the Christians. Well, you're talking to one right now. He's telling you Muhammad was not a prophet. Right. But uh, Muhammad, did, I don't think he taught that. But what Muhammad did argue is that the Quran is the proof, the great proof that he was a prophet. Because the Quran is such a great book. It's such an eloquent book. It's, perfectly, it's perfect in its grammar. But I don't think the book is eloquent at all. And I don't think it's perfect in its grammar. In fact, I've written on it. Uh, all you have to do is go online and look at the uh, Arabic corpus, and you can find errors in the Quran's grammar yourself. If you know basic grammar, you can go through the Quran and find all these grammatical mistakes. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying if something has grammatical mistakes, that proves that it's false. But if somebody says that the proof that it's inspired is that it's perfect Arabic, it's got perfect grammar and so forth, well, that would be a disproof, wouldn't it? <laughs> and I can go on and on talking about why I don't think the Quran is a great book. I don't think it proves Muhammad's prophethood. And I think people have duplicated. Uh, uh, he says that if you can disprove this, all you have to do is produce something like it, right? Produce surahs like it. And I think people have done that. Muslims don't believe so, but I think they have. But that was Muhammad's argument. That's not the argument you heard. Why? Why does he lack confidence in that argument? Probably for the same reason I do. I don't think it's a good argument. The Quran contains errors, uh, grammar, and other errors, more serious errors, like saying that it's God really has hands. And with that, I'll conclude my rebuttal. Okay, now it's Andrew for his 11-minute response. Right. Anyone who's gotten into enough arguments, even at Twitter, will know that if somebody seems to do nothing but just completely misrepresent everything you've said, that's probably a sign of desperation. If anybody sitting here is actually under the impression that my point was simply, oh, the Bible is so untrue, and that's my argument, you just weren't listening to me at all. I made my, if anything, I was worried that I was going out of my way to be repetitive in making myself clear. Incidental revision, from a secular point of view, is like we were hearing the only version of the story he knew. Correction without it being the point, no hint of revisionism, didn't I say that? Didn't I go out of my way to make it clear that this was about the fulfillment of prophecies and that we were getting to the heart of the matter historically? I laid out a very careful step-by-step -step argument. Oh, it's just, it's just going after and attacking the Bible. Give me a break here. By the way, what I requested is that we use Ahmed Didat's debate format. He positively would not do that. And I found it interesting here, uh, Anthony, you said when you were debating Osama Abdali, you said that if the that if the if it's not if uh, Muhammad for you said to him if Muhammad fails at being foretold by the Bible, that makes him a false prophet. So would it not follow that if it if that's true, it would make him a true prophet? Anyway, I also made it, I also made it clear, did I not? that the anthropomorphizing itself was not such a big deal, or may not be such a big deal. The main point was the lack of omniscience. That's the, that's the big deal, which you just declared to be an idiom, that you just said it's only a figure of speech, and you did not give one hint of a reason why. These things are all over the Bible, the equivalent of saying he has hands, and I don't make a point of those. For example, Dan Barker's list of biblical contradictions. Does God live in light? Does God live in darkness? 
I don't cite that. I don't find that kind of thing to be a big deal. What is a big deal and it was when he says things like, I will go down and see what's happening and then I will know. I see no reason to think that's an only an idiom and you didn't even give us a reason. You, you, in fact, you just went, you, all of these irrelevant, the angels bow down to Adam, the genetic fallacies about the black stone ritual, what does this have to do with anything? And as for the Quran and the Bible, I think it's high time that all of us, Christian and Muslim alike, I've been as guilty of this in the past as anyone, I admit, I think it's high time we all just finally accept that we need to stop overcomplicating the matter of what the Quran actually means with the terms law, literally Torah and gospel. Because it makes itself pretty clear here, uh, maybe. Surah 3 verse 48 says that Jesus, we, it says in reference to Jesus, bless him, we will teach him the scripture and the wisdom and the Torah, that is the law, and the gospel. Not only is he being given the Torah, or does he think that Muhammad, bless him, was under the impression that he wrote the Torah? It says that in addition to him being given the scripture, the scripture and the gospel, and the Torah, he was given the scripture and the gospel and the Torah, and the wisdom. As a matter of fact, that's the same term, it's, it's the hikmata, if I pronounce that correctly, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of words here, used in 2269. He gives wisdom to whoever he wants. So I think it's pretty clear here that these terms refer to the revelations themselves. Sometimes the revelations are in written text or take the form of written text. Sometimes they don't. So you see, it varies. What is it? I don't even know what he's talking about here. Blessed, something out of his nostrils. I don't even know what that, what, what is this? I, I don't know where that is in the Quran. Anyway. Oh yes, uh, 1094, Quran 1094. It's hardly the only passage in the Quran where it says people, for those among the people of the scriptures, Christians or Jews, have come to believe already, have come to believe in Islam already, so go consult them, go talk to them. It's hardly the only place where it says that. It doesn't mean go consult them because the Bible is 100% true. It means they've come to believe because it was foretold, Muhammad's coming was foretold. So you see, it's referring to them. They've come to believe they know. Really, he didn't even say much that's worth responding to. He just mo he mostly just pretended that all I did was attack the Bible. And if you were listening, you would know that I didn't. Maybe it's a good sign. Maybe I have him on the ropes already. Okay, now we're going to reverse the format. <clears throat> Anthony's going to speak for 33 minutes. Brother Anthony, take it away. All right, thank you for that, Andrew. Uh, once again, it's good to be with you. This is my positive presentation, so as much as I want to respond to that and correct his misconceptions, I'm going to have to plot away and just give you some of the reasons why I don't believe that Muhammad is a prophet. Now, as a Christian, of course, I think it's very simple to decide whether or not Muhammad was a prophet. Right? Since I believe what God, speaking by Christ through his spirit and the Holy Scriptures, has said about himself, and since Muhammad contradicted that, I don't believe that Muhammad was a prophet. Right? I don't believe what Muhammad says in the Quran or in the Hadith or in the Sirah literature about God, about man, about Christ, about salvation. I don't believe any of that to be coming from God. I think it contradicts the word that God had already spoken. For example, just to give you a few, according to the Bible, since there's none greater by whom God can swear, something that would seem to stand to reason, even apart from the text of Scripture saying it, there's none greater by whom he can swear, so he swears by himself. I swear by myself, as long as I live, says the Lord, such and such, and the promise follows. But in the Quran, Allah is found swearing by everything under the sun, including the sun, including Muhammad, including the Quran, including the stars, including the mountains and the sun. Everything is sworn by, by Allah. That seems to me to be speak that the God of the Quran is not speaking from the perspective of the transcendent creator, but from the perspective of someone on earth who would swear by created things. Okay. For another example of how the Quran contradicts the Bible, according to the standard of the Bible, anyone who rejects the Father and the Son is an antichrist. 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 4. Okay. Muhammad, in no uncertain terms, rejected the Father and the Son. Surah 5, 17 and 18. Surah 112. So by the standards of the Bible, Muhammad was an antichrist. As well, since the God of the Bible is a father, we're told that he loves sinners. And even that he sent his son to die for them. 
when they were still at envy with him. In short, the Bible tells us that we love God because he first loved us. In contrast to that, the Quran says Allah only loves those who love him and who do righteous good deeds and so on and so forth. That's explicit. That's verbatim in the Quran. Allah does not love those who don't first love him. That sounds like my angry next door neighbor. Uh, that sounds like what Jesus said is true of the pagans. Don't they even love those who love them, right? I'm sorry, that doesn't cut it. But not only do we see doctrinal differences, we also see differences in worship and practice and so forth. Uh, he claimed there is no significance to my bringing up the black stone. I'm sorry, there is. The God of the Bible abominates that. Okay, but all of this uh, is assuming that the Bible is true. And you've already heard from Andrew that he doesn't accept the Bible. So while all of that is convincing to me, it wouldn't be convincing to Andrew. Andrew doesn't share my assumptions. He doesn't share my presuppositions, my commitment to the Bible as God's Word. He believes in a different standard, a different prophet, a different God, a different book. Right? He looks to the Quran. So what I'm going to do is show Andrew, now that I've already showed him from my position that it's false, I'm going to show him that on his own assumptions, the Quran is false. I'm going to do this by looking at a handful of issues central to Muhammad's message. What Muhammad said about Allah, what he said about his book, what he said about uh, himself. Right? What Muhammad said about himself, what he said about Allah's book, and what he said about his God. With that said, I want to turn to the first of those three issues, Muhammad's God, Allah. In Surah 4, 171, it says, Believe in Allah and his messengers, and do not say three. Desist, for this would be best for you. God in truth is one. Glory be to him that he should have a child. To him belongs what is in the heavens and what is on earth. God suffices as all worthy of trust. Now, as Christians typically understand this verse, Muhammad is charging us with believing in three gods. However, in an article that Andrew wrote on the Trinity, he seeks to defend the Quran against this error by rejecting that interpretation. Along the way, he tells us what he believes as a Muslim about Allah. Okay, what it means to say that he is one over and against the Christian doctrine that God is tripersonal, the one God is tripersonal. Here's what he says, and I quote, We seem to have a case of people insisting on seeing claims of literal polytheism where there are none. What part of that passage sounded to you like there are three gods? What it actually says is, do not so much as say the word three at all. God is one, period. End of story, and that's all there is to it. The use of the phrase, God and truth is one, makes it clear that the book is acknowledging that Trinitarians are not engaging in actual polytheism, but instead are mitigating their monotheism with the attribution of a son to the Godhead. In other words, according to Andrew, the passage is not saying that Christians believe in three gods outright. Andrew recognizes that we believe in only one God, and he claims this verse of the Quran recognizes that as well. The problem with our view, according to Andrew's Muslim understanding of this passage, is that we mitigate or compromise monotheism when we say that God in himself is anything other than one. One, one, one. That's it. Period. End of story. That's what he said, right? The problem with our view is that we attribute something to God beyond mere oneness. Okay, the particular example given here is that we attribute a son to God. I think God attributed one to himself, but in any case, uh, not a son who's separate and an additional God, because Andrews ruled that out, right? We don't believe in free God. But a son who is essentially one with the Father, one in his nature, one in his being. He shares the same being and essence of, as God. Andrew rules that out because he thinks that it compromises monotheism. It goes beyond saying that God in himself is only one. That's radical, folks. I, I know that we don't usually think in this way or about these things. We just let these things slip over us, but it's radical. The view that Andrew articulates here is remarkably similar to the view advocated by the famed translator of the Quran, Muhammad Asad. For example, in his commentary on Surah 112, Asad says, Allah is one and unique in every respect. Let that sink in. It's going to be devastating. That sounds a lot like Andrew, doesn't it? One, only one, period. Well, this might not initially sound very complicated or problematic in itself, the idea that Allah is one and only one, one in every respect, that nothing can be attributed to him and so forth, logically entails or infers that Allah does not have a plurality of attributes. It's that simple. Right? Remember, no internal diversity of any sort. Don't say three. Well, if you can't say three, don't say 99. Don't say 99 attributes. 99 names and attributes of Allah. That's a, that's a cardinal position of Islam. Right? Nothing can be attributed to him. Remember that. Do not say three. Do not say 99. But if Allah does not have a plurality of attributes, as this infers then Allah is undefinable. Okay? Maybe that sounds pious to you. In a minute, it's going to sound terrible to you. Listen to Muhammad Asad again. He recognized, at least partially, the implications of this view. Asad writes, and again I quote, any attempt at defining him or his attributes is a logical impossibility and, from the ethical point of view, a sin. The fact that he is undefinable makes it clear that the attributes, he puts them in scare quotes, that's an indication that he doesn't really believe that he has attributes, 
the, the, the attribute, or the fact that he's undefinable makes it clear that the attributes of God mentioned in the Quran do not circumscribe his reality. They don't really tell you who he is or what he's like. All they do is they tell you something about the perceptible effect of his activity on and within the universe created by him. Okay? Now, if Allah is attributeless and undefinable, then he's not a knowable being. To quote Asad again, this time from Surah 112, the fact that God is one and unique in every respect has its logical correlate in the statement that there is nothing that can be compared with him, thus precluding any possibility of describing him or defining him. Consequently, the quality of his being is beyond the range of human comprehension or imagination, which also explains why any attempt at depicting God by means of figurative representations or even abstract symbols must be qualified as a blasphemous denial of the truth. Right? Now let's be clear. Assad is not simply saying that Allah can't be fully comprehended or understood by us, something I wouldn't have any trouble with. I believe that as a Christian, God is not fully comprehensible by us. But Assad is saying that Allah, since he's one in every respect, and therefore lacking attributes in any real sense, is undefinable, and therefore not even conceivable or apprehensible by us. Okay? Now, if Allah has no attributes that circumscribe his reality and can't be defined or conceived, then he also can't be thought of as a person or a personal being. Personal beings have attributes, distinguishing characteristics that mark them off from others, that tell us something about them in distinction from somebody else. But since Allah has no attributes or defining characteristics, then he can't be categorized as a person. That's not just my inference, that's Assad's inference, the guy he agrees with on his version of oneness. says essentially the same thing as him. To quote Assad one last time, the core of the argument is an exposition of God's oneness and uniqueness. He's the prime cause of all that exists, but no human vision can encompass him, either physically or conceptually. And therefore, he is sublimely exalted above anything that men may devise by way of definition. Consequently, any endeavor to define God within the categories of human thought or to reduce him to the concept of a person constitutes a blasphemous attempt at limiting his infinite existence. So put all this together. Not only is Allah not three persons, he's not even a person. In fact, Allah is unknowable, undefinable, impersonal, and I fail to see how he's any, any different than the non-existent. The non-existent also has no positive attributes or characteristics, doesn't it? You can't say anything positively about non-existence. Well, you can't say anything positively about his deity. If you do that, sure, that's what he said. But I have further problems here, and you'll see this as similar to what I've already brought up. It's just because of, uh, well, let me say this before I get into that. It's just because of all of this that many Muslim theologians and philosophers say the Quran is not a revelation of Allah's nature or person or character, but of Allah's actions and will. Remember that. Uh, remember what Muhammad Asad said. Allah's so-called attributes don't circumscribe his reality. All that one can do is describe the perceptible effects of his activity from what you see in the world. You just look at what's happening and you describe Allah based on what you see happening. Which means that your perception of Allah will change according to the different circumstances that you encounter. Right? The implications of that are far-reaching and devastating because if Allah doesn't act or issue commands according to a fixed, immutable nature and character because he's attributeless, and so he is simply uh, being named from whatever he chooses to do, then he can just as well do or command one thing one day and do or command another thing the next day. That is, the Islamic deity turns out, on this account, to be arbitrary and fickle, a being who can change the rules of the game as he goes along, a God who doesn't have to keep his promises, and so forth. And that is not a being in whom anyone can put their trust, much less can they put their trust in any man who would proclaim such a God. That's why science didn't originate, by the way, in an Islamic concept, uh, t context. An arbitrary and fickle deity governing the universe cannot consistently provide a reliable foundation for the uniformity of nature, which is the presupposition on which science rests or operates. Without a God who acts consistently with his own rational nature, holy nature, immutable nature, we have no reliable basis for believing in a causal nexus, where one thing is viewed as a type of event that it tells us uh, what we can expect in other cases. Okay? So his deity completely undermines our belief in science, and not just science. Okay? And don't misunderstand me, I think scientists can be mistaken, but it doesn't just believe, uh, undermine our ability to do science, but to learn anything from experience. A fickle deity behind our experience is not a basis for believing in anything. It's no better than positing chance in back of everything. Chance, you see, would swallow up the possibility that one thing can be intellig intelligibly related to another thing, and so on. I won't go down with that further. But if Muhammad were a prophet, we would expect him to be consistent with his own insistence on Allah's absolute unity, and thus not only refrain from attributing a son to Allah, but from attributing anything to him beyond your oneness. 
Okay? No one can claim to be speaking from the true God if he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. Right? God doesn't speak with a forked tongue. In fact, the Quran tells us that. If this Quran were from someone other than Allah, you'd find in it much contradiction, much discrepancy. Well, uh, alas, we have to look and see that in the Quran, Muhammad had he fallen out with himself and contradicted his own teaching by saying that Allah does have attributes, many attributes, a whole smorgasbord of attributes, right? This is in direct contradiction to Andrew's understanding of Allah's oneness, so oneness that rules out all attribution and diversity in his being. And the idea that Allah has attributes uh, falls into the category, according to Andrew, that he calls mitigated or compromised monotheism and sure. What's even worse for Andrew is the fact that his prophet not only taught that Allah has spiritual attributes and qualities, which contradict the idea that his God is one in every respect, but his prophet even asserted that his God has a plurality of anthropomorphic attributes. And by the way, the passage that I was referring to about the blast of his nostrils was that I was referring to an idiom found in the Bible, not the Quran, so just to help you out there. But his God, his prophet, said that his God, who's supposed to be without attributes, had all kinds of attributes, including anthropomorphic ones, the ones that he has such a problem with in the Bible. But listen to Andrew before I get into that. I want you to hear how much Andrew hates this idea. God made us to worship, serve, or please him. Indeed, submission or surrender. This is from his article on the Trinity. Indeed, submission or surrender is the very meaning of the word Islam in Arabic. Since his one purpose in making us was for us to do this, it's easy to understand why he would be quite a stickler about nothing ever getting in the way of our carrying out the task of worshiping him alone, that is, prostrating to him alone. This is why, for example, icons, images, aren't allowed in our religion. They're considered a kind of shirt. Keep this in mind. Nor should you have any problem speaking to him, just so long as you're trying. You don't need any object to represent anything. You can't give a formless thing. Gosh, sounds like Andrew can't speak consistently with the idea of Allah being a person either. You can't give a formless thing a form. You just need yourself, I'm still quoting Andrew, your thoughts, your words, and God's grace. Anything else is a distraction, and only muddies things up, takes away the purity. Still quoting Andrew, now here's the thing, deifying people also counts as shirk according to Islam. You're associating a human being, a human body, with God. You aren't supposed to give him a form. Remember, it's comparable to using icons. Whether the image you make it for the deity is graven or of flesh, it's still an image. So according to Andrew, the Quran's teaching on Allah's oneness leads to the view that he's a formless thing. And I would agree with Andrew here. That is what Muhammad's view of oneness logically entails. But here's the problem, and I've already mentioned it. The same Muhammad who taught that Allah is one without diversity, who then contradicted himself and said his deity has all kinds of attributes, that same Muhammad taught that his God has a form. He's not a formless thing. In a Termidi Hadith, number 237, narrated by Abdul Rahman ibn Aish, we are told that Allah's messenger, that's Muhammad, said, I saw my Lord be exalted and glorious in the most beautiful form. He said, this is Allah speaking to Muhammad, he said, what do the angels in the presence of Allah contend about? I said, thou art the most aware of it. That is, Muhammad said that to Allah. You know it best. Then, it says, Allah placed his palm, placed his palm, those are the same hands he created Adam with, placed his palm between my shoulders and I felt its coldness in my chest. He felt the cold touch of his deity. Very touching. In addition, and I could go on, there's more to that hadith. In addition, since Muhammad <coughs> taught that Allah had a form, it's hardly surprising that he said his deity would be seen, Muhammad said this, his deity would be seen by Muslims on the Day of Judgment, just like Muhammad had already seen him when he touched his chest. Narrated Abdur, Said, uh, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri, during the lifetime of the Prophet, some people said to him, O oh, Allah's Apostle, shall we see our Lord on the Day of Resurrection? The Prophet said, Yes. Do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun at midday when it's bright and there's no cloud in the sky? They replied, no. He said, do you have any difficulty in seeing the moon on a full moon night when it's bright and there's no cloud in the sky? They replied, no. The prophet said, you will have no difficulty seeing Allah on the day of resurrection as you have no difficulty in seeing either of them, that is the sun or the moon. So we have the form. He was seen by Muhammad. He will be seen by people on the day of resurrection. But moreover, in that same hadith, this is from Bukhari 6.60.105, it goes on to say that Allah will have appeared to people at, in several different forms, okay, in this city. And after everybody else is gone, Allah is going to appear to the Muslims in his true form. Okay, so after shape-shifting a bit, he appears in his true form. And here's what it says. Then Allah, the Lord of the world, will come to them in a shape nearest to the picture they had in their minds about him. The mental image that they had of Allah, what he called idolatry. This is what his prophet taught. 
His God has a form. His God can be imagined in the mind. That's how they're going to recognize Allah on that day. Other hadiths say that Allah is going to make it clear who he is by exposing his shin. Uh, so the form, I guess, includes a striking shin. In any case, what did Andrew say about images and icons, right? Reasoning from the fact that Allah is one, uh, without form, and with not, uh, no attributes attributed to him, Andrew concluded that it's wrong to have images of Allah. But insofar as Muhammad was inconsistent, he ended up giving with one hand what he took away with the other. Right? Since he ended up ascribing all kinds of attributes to his deity, even anthropomorphic ones, he ended up saying that his deity has a form, could be seen, would be seen, and in fact that one can and must have mental images uh, of him in their minds. Andrew calls that shirk, idolatry, and so do I. Uh, now, I want you to put all this together okay, before I turn to the book. How much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. If we put all of this together, what Muhammad taught about Allah leaves Muslims in the unenviable position of choosing between what I call shirk or shorn. Okay? Those are the options. Either Muhammad taught a religion of shirk, a religion that compromises what he taught about true oneness, right? what true monotheism is, by attributing a plurality to his absolutely one deity. Right? Or he's guilty of, shor, uh, 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 it's either shirk by attributing a plurality to him, or his deity is shorn or divested of all attributes. Right? So he becomes an attributeless, undefinable, unknowable being. Those are your options. Pick your poison. Really, you don't get the choice. You don't get to choose. They're both taught in the Islamic sources. The Islamic sources teach both of those. So the deity of Islam is involved in an irresolvable dialectical tension of being on the one hand absolutely one, in which case you have no attributes, and on the other hand of being a plurality of attributes uh, that compromises oneness. And, and uh, both of those are abominated in the Quran. Uh, now, the next problem that I want to deal with, I, I, I'll turn from that to the Quran, uh, is what uh, Muhammad taught about the Quran and what Orthodox Islam teaches, and so therefore I assume what Andrew believes about the Quran. Andrew believes that the Quran is eternal. It's Allah's eternal speech. Right? The Quran is not something Muhammad was inspired to write. It's rather something that Gabriel conveyed to Muhammad. He got the info from the book and he made it known to Muhammad. And yet, according to Islam, this eternal Quran, this thing that has always been and never came into being, is not the same as Allah. In fact, Andrew admits that this eternal Quran is not Allah. For example, he mentioned Twitter, so I'll mention Twitter. In response to someone who asked on Twitter if the Quran can make a miracle happen, Andrew said the following on March 29th of this year, quote, the noble Quran not being Allah, no, it didn't cause this event. Okay, so it didn't do this miracle. The Quran is not Allah. So picture it, folks. There's an eternal book besides Allah who is not Allah. Okay, now there's two options for Andrew. Either this Quran existed eternally outside of God or it existed eternally in his God. Either one of those fall prey to the same problem I've already illustrated. If the Quran is something that has existed eternally outside of his deity, then it's polytheism. A kind of polytheism, he says, is not even true of the Trinity. It's not believed in three separate additional gods. But if he says that the Quran has existed eternally in his deity, then his deity is not absolutely one. Say not two. God is one God. God is one in truth. That's a problem, folks. It's a whopper of a problem. And it shows that Muhammad can't be a prophet. Because the Quran can't be what it claims to be if its view of God is what it is. If it rules out the very fundamental thing that Islam is supposed to be about. No shirk, right? No shirk. The Quran is itself the single greatest refutation of the claim that Islam is not a religion of shirk. I'm afraid that's an embellishment on the truth of God's uh, nature. Now, finally, I want to turn to uh, Muhammad. I want you to remember what I read from Andrew earlier about the meaning of Islam. Earlier I quoted Andrew as saying that Islam means submission. Submission to Allah alone, right? One God, one God, not two, not three. Submission to Allah alone. That's what Muslim means, one who submits. So Islam means submission, Muslim is one who submits. The number of ways Muhammad violated this in his own teachings as an alleged prophet is found all throughout the Quran, the Hadith, the Sira literature, the biographies of Muhammad. Uh, but listen to this, in Surah 9, 29. We're told, fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor in the latter day, nor do they prohibit what Allah and his messenger have prohibited. So Allah and Muhammad prohibit things. We are to submit to what both of them say. That's Surah 929. Surah 33, 6 says, when Allah and his messengers have decreed a matter, it's not for a believer, man or woman, that they should have uh, any option in their decision. Whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, that is those two, 
He has indeed strayed in plain error. What they have decreed, it's not simply that Muhammad is issuing decrees from Allah, it's what they have decreed. Muhammad and Allah, Allah's partner. Verse four, so, uh, chapter 4, verse 65 of the Quran. But know by thy Lord, they, that is those people over there that are opposing Muhammad, they will not believe till they make thee the judge regarding the disagreement between them. Then they shall find in themselves no impediment touching your verdict, Muhammad, but shall surrender to him in full submission. Whoa. Submission. Islam means submission to one God alone. Muhammad in 465 says, and to me, as a second, next to Allah. Another way of saying this uh, is from, uh, we can see this from a number of hadith, according to numerous hadith, Muhammad often would become annoyed with one of his followers and lose his temper and would then curse them and hear, hurl malediction upon them or even beat them. In a number of cases, the hadith tell us that Muhammad would do this to people who didn't do anything wrong uh, or, or anything worthy of Muhammad's evil treatment. For example, in Sahih Muslim, book 32, number 6297, we're told that Muhammad saw an orphan girl and then cursed her, saying, may you not advance in years. The hadith goes on to tell us that a woman who cared for the orphan girl came to Muhammad and said, what have you done? What is this, Muhammad? What have you done to her? In response to her, we're told that Muhammad smiled. Okay? All kinds of pastoral qualities exuding from the man, right? That Muhammad smiled and then said to her, according to this hadith and many others, Do you not know that I made a covenant, a condition, a term with Allah, that Allah would never go against or transgress, that if I ever curse somebody who doesn't deserve it, that Allah would uh, bless them instead of uh, doing evil to them? That might sound like it's a rescue uh, from what Muhammad had done. He was insensitive, he attacks this little poor orphan girl, and now he says, oh, but I set a decree, I uh, set a term with Allah, and said that he couldn't transgress this, that he would bless someone that I curse wrongly. But did you catch it? Did you catch what Muhammad just did? Who is Muhammad, even as a prophet, to make a covenant for God, to set a condition, a term for God? In the Bible, the corrupt, embellished, untrustworthy, unreliable Bible, Okay? where God is consistent with his own character, doesn't lie, doesn't swear by uh, other created things, in that Bible, we're told that God alone issues covenants. God alone sets the terms for a relationship with him. God alone makes promises that he holds himself to. Okay? But here is Muhammad, Allah's partner, who decrees things together with Allah, telling Allah, if I do this and I'm wrong and she didn't really deserve it, I flew off the handle, I was bad-tempered, uh, then you do this, okay? That's even contrary to statements in the Quran, Surah 17, 111. It says he has no partner in his sovereignty. And in Surah 18, 26, where it says that Allah uh, makes no one to share in his decision and his rule. I've read for you passages where Muhammad does share in his decision and rule, even to the point of telling Allah things that he needs to do. Now, if that isn't enough to show the marrow of the man, we're even told in Surah 17, 79, that the hope was held out to Muhammad, that Allah would raise Muhammad to an exalted station. Right? According to a hadith from Nafi, which he narrated from Ibn Umar, who narrated it from Muhammad, who said concerning this verse, that Allah will seat him with him on the throne, and that he will intercede for Muslims on the day of judgment. The authenticity of this hadith is supported by a number of renowned Islamic scholars, including Mujahid, Al-Tabari, uh, Al-Qurtabi. Okay? This is the spirit of Muhammadan religion, of Muhammad's religion, a religion that wants to unseat Jesus as the reigning Lord and put Muhammad in his place. This is why I said at the beginning that Muhammad is not a prophet, but antichrist. And he's not simply an antichrist by the criteria that I have given you, but by the Quran's own criteria, by criteria that Andrew has given you. So he can't come up here and complain anymore about the Bible. That Bible that can clearly condemns all of this shirk and this polytheism. He can't complain about the Bible. What he needs to do is show that these things are consistent on his own assumptions. If not, then his religion must be seen as a self-refuting religion. Muhammad could not be a prophet because what Muhammad said about Allah is just plain mass confusion. It's not something that you can put together. It's not something you can make heads or tails of. It's not something that makes any intelligible sense or coherent. Uh, and it won't do for him to attack the Trinity. I could care less if he doesn't think that my God is in himself altogether beautiful. Okay? I'm not asking him to do that as far as this debate is concerned. We'll debate Jesus next uh, in our next debate. What he needs to do is make his God intelligible. Okay? What he needs to do is make sense out of the Quran, being a second in addition to its deity, which is the fundamental uh, the violation of the fundamental idea of Islam, that there's no shirk and so forth. He needs to account for why his prophet pretended to sit alongside of his God on earth and who said that he would be doing the same thing in heaven. 
according to his own narrations. And with that, I'll conclude. With that said, uh, Andrew, for his 22-minute response. It's going to eat up a lot of my time, but I'm going to do it anyway, because God willing, because it's high time that somebody did this. Surah 9, starting with verse 1, going all the way. Immunity is granted those idolaters by God and his apostle with whom you have a treaty. They can move about for four months freely in the land, but should, the, should know that they cannot escape the law of God, and that God can put the unbelievers to shame. A general proclamation is made, I'll talk fast, this day of the great pil greater pilgrimage on the part of God and his apostle, that God is not bound by any contract to idolaters, nor is his apostle. It is therefore better for you to repent. If you do not, remember that you cannot elude the grip of God. So announce to those who deny the truth the news of painful punishment, except those idolaters with whom you have a treaty, who have not failed you in the least, nor helped anyone against you. Fulfill your obligations to them during the term of the treaty. God loves those who take heed for themselves. But when the, these months prohibited for fighting are over, slay the idolaters wheresoever you find them, and take them captive or besiege them, and lie in wait for them at every likely place. But if they repent and fulfill their devotional obligations and pay the zakat, then let them go their way, for God is forgiving and kind. If an idolater seeks protection, then give him asylum, that he may hear the word of God. Then escort him to a place of safety, for they are people who do not know. How could there be a treaty between idolaters and God and his apostle, except those who covenanted by the sacred mosque? Therefore, as long as they are honest with you, notice that this subject has not changed. Be correct with them, for God loves those who are godly. And I'll talk about that in a moment, God willing. How can they be trusted? If they prevail against you, they will neither observe paths nor good faith with you. They flatter you with their tongues, but their hearts are averse to you, for most of them are iniquitous. They barter away the words of God for a petty price and obstruct others from his path. How evil indeed are the things they do. They have no regard for kinship or treaties with believers, for they are transgressors. But if they repent and are firm in devotion and pay the zakat, then they are your brothers in faith. We explain our commands distinctly for those who understand. If they break their pledge after giving their word and revile your faith, fight the specimens of faithlessness, for surely their oaths have no sanctity. They may happily desist. Will you not fight those who broke their pledge and plotted to banish the apostle and were the first to attack you? Are you afraid of them? If you are believers, you should fear God more. Fight them so that God may punish them in your hands and put them to shame and help you against them and heal the wounds of the hearts of believers and remove the anger from their breasts. For God turns to whosoever desires. Notice they're talking about the same people here. Same context, doesn't change. God is all-knowing and all-wise. Do you think you will get away before God knows who among you fought and did not take anyone but God, his apostle, and the faithful as their friends? God is cognizant of all that you do. The idolaters have no right to visit the mosques of God while bearing testimony to their disbelief. Meaningless will be their acts, and in hell they will lie forever. Only those who believe in God of the last day, who fulfill their devotional obligations, pay the zakat, and fear no one but God, can visit the mosque of God. Same people talk about the mosque still. They may hope to be among the guided. Do you think that giving a drink of water to the pilgrims and going on a visit to the sacred mosque is the same as believing in God on the last day and striving in the cause of God? In the eyes of God it is not the same, and God does not show the unrighteous the way. Those who accepted the faith and left their homes and fought in the way of God, wealth and soul, have a greater reward with God and will be successful. Their Lord announces to them news of his mercy, acceptance, and gardens of lasting bliss, which they will enjoy forever. Indeed, God has greater rewards with him. O you who believe, do not hold your fathers and brothers as friends if they hold disbelief more dear than faith. Remember, us talking earlier about this subject. And those of you who are, do so are iniquitous. You tell them if your fathers and sons, your brothers and wives and families and wealth, or the business you fear may fail, and the mansions that you love are dearer to you than God as apostle and struggling in his cause. Same cause, same subject. Then wait until God's command arrives, for God does not show transgressors the way. Indeed, God has helped you on many occasions, even during the battle of Hunain, when you were elated with joy at your numbers, which did not prove the, of the least avail, so that the earth in its vast expanse became too narrow for you, and you turned back and retreated. Then God sent down a sense of tranquility on his apostle and the faithful, and sent down troops invisible to punish the infidels. This is the recompense of those who do not believe. Yet God may turn even after this to the whomsoever he pleased, for God is compassionate and kind. O believers, the idolaters are unclean, so they should not approach the holy mosque. The same one they were borrowing from, they attacked first. After this year, in case you fear indigence from the stoppage of business with them, 
Then God will enrich you of his bounty if he will, for God is all-knowing and all-wise. Fight those people of the book who do not believe in God in the last day, who do not prohibit what God and his apostle have forbidden, nor accept divine law, until all of them pay protective tax and submission. The subject does not change. Same context, starting from verse 1 all the way through verse 29. The people who attacked first, who tried to bar, it does not change. All you have to do is just read the whole thing. But the next debate, he's just going to make the same thing. He's going to say 929, and he's going to do the same thing all over again. Now, as for that, he does not love these people. God does not love those people. You can look this up easily. There are lots of resources that allow you to look up the word. Look this up in Abdul Man and Omar's dictionary, the Holy Quran, for example. It can mean love, like, or wish. It can mean prefer. In this case, it seems to. It's not hard to believe that the same word used in 314. Great men are filled with the lust of earthly pleasures, women, children, gold, silver, horses, land, cattle, a lust that is in vain. It's the same word used here, have All right. Now. Some of his stuff he said, I don't even know what he's talking about. Frankly, the attributes, make, is he saying attributes make, having 99 attributes makes him incomprehensible? Is he saying that this is comparable, the attributes are comparable to the Trinity? So having 99 attributes is like having three hypostases now, having three persons in one being. Is that, I have a lot of attributes, don't I? I know I, I'm not a deity, but I don't see how this compares. Having, okay. He, okay, we believe he has 99 attributes. They believe he's three persons and one God. I, I fail to make the connection here. Attributes are attributes. And as for the Trinity, let me put it this way. Now, I hope I'm not misrepresenting Hinduism here, okay? It's my understanding that Hinduism isn't so much a religion as it is a, an umbrella term for a lot of different religions. But at least one interpretation of it is that there is one deity, one single deity that... Hindus refer to figuratively as hundreds of different gods, even though they believe it's actually just one being. In fact, by some interpretations, it's actually just one being in the universe. But other Hindus, I think, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, I don't want to misrepresent, especially offend Hindus if they are reading or watching this. I think that the belief in at least one form of Hinduism is that there's actually one god, but they refer to it, they think of it, or at least speak of it, as being as though it is several hundred different gods. They're, they all have their own attributes, they're all, they're basically a different person, but it's actually one god. Now, how, ultimately, how different is that? Is it different because they're using the word god? Is it different because of it? It seems to me like more of a semantic difference than anything. So you have to ask yourself, would you call a Hindu a polytheist? I don't see what the significant difference is there. I'm just saying it because he brought that up. I'm not, he said, I can talk about the Trinity. Well, I'm just talking about it because this relates to the arguments that he made. Now, he talked about incomprehensibility. He said that something about, again, I had trouble following some of the stuff he said. It was so illogical. But he made the accusation that Islam makes God praise him incomprehensible. Well, it is my, in my experience, anyway, when you talk to a Christian, about the Trinity, they will quickly make the defense when it's convenient for them. That I'm a, I, some of the people here may be different, but the ones that I talk to will very quickly make the defense that the can, they might, might outside of an argument. You, it is often understood. In fact, this is in the Athanasian Creed that the Trinity is supposed to be incomprehensible. Your understanding of deity involves incomprehensibility necessarily. That's how you think of it. The Trinity is supposed to be beyond moral comprehension. Isn't that what St. Augustine said? And so, I mean, it seems to me you, you're supposed to believe that. I don't see how I believe. The 99 traits are descriptions that tell you about him. I, I'm sorry, I just don't see it. They're, they're, I don't see any contradiction between them. I didn't hear him propose any contradiction between the traits. They describe how he is. Whereas the Trinity is so complex, at least theologically complex, if not contradictory, that Christians devote volumes and volumes to explaining it, and it's, the idea of it is that it's 
so difficult for mortal minds to grasp something like this, something so apparently inconsistent, that it is incomprehensible to us. All right. You said, let's see what I got here. All right. How, mu how much time do I have left? 12 minutes. Thank you. That should be enough time. And every debate, the, every debate with these center people here, they shift the burden of proof. When it comes to Hadith, they quote a Hadith, they declare it authentic, usually the most that you get. Yes, these are, he used the words the Islamic sources teach. Now, in his case, with one of the Ahadith he quoted, he cited a few scholars, but that's about as most as you're going to get. Once, with one of them, they'll cite a few people. With one of them, they might say, okay, this is in both Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Half of what's in Sahih Bukhari is in Sahih Muslim, if you're hardly skimming the cream of the crop. As a matter of fact, Sahih Bukhari, which they mainly quote from, is not the oldest Hadith collection. Do you know that? It's Malik's Muwatta. I'm probably mispronouncing a lot of words, like I said. The Hadith collections are not written to be quoted. They are written to be very carefully scrutinized. You've got to go out of your way. You see, they, they, in fact, a newcomer, somebody who doesn't know anything about them, would get the impression from the way these people talk that they, we're quoting your own sources to you that they're supposed to be, I'm not saying these are your intentions, but a newcomer would get the impression they're supposed to be inspired and infallible. It's the opposite. Contradictory accounts are placed right next to each other. Notes are added in saying, this is also related the same way, except for a slight difference in wording by such and such, with a different chain of narrators. And it's not even so much a matter of what collection it's from, it's more about the chains of narration, but that's more the beginning of the task of finding out what's authentic, what's true, and what isn't than otherwise. You also have to look at the text itself, and bearing in mind that it's not either 100% true or 100% false. When someone tells you a story, you don't see if they're thinking, either he's, what he's saying is absolutely correct, or, or he got all of the details wrong. You understand he might get only a few details wrong. So you see, hadith assessment is a complicated matter. I hope I didn't sound glib myself earlier, quoting Haykal. He had a wonderful methodology. You see, he applied rigorous skepticism to all the Hadith collections and the biographies. He considered every viewpoint. He even used as sources some of the some very Islamophobic Orientalists. Didn't seem to spend more time arguing with them, but he cited them and learned from them sometimes. Every point of view, because anyone could be right. And he used the Quran as his main source, not because he believed in it, because it's the oldest source. It was written by somebody who was there, you know, from a historical point of view, written by and. It goes back to the beginning, but he entertained no delusions about how to interpret it. For example, he threw away any miracle story like the water appearing out of nowhere, because the Quran says that the miracles are itself and the prophecies that are fulfilled. So if he has a source equal to or greater than that in his, in his methodology, I'd like to hear it. But anyway, you can't just quote out, you have to go out of your way. The burden of proof, the bottom line is the burden of proof is on the person saying this happened. You'll notice that in Christian apologetics there is a curious inconsistency. They will mock the Quran for coming along 600 years after the fact. They will mock the Quran for having parallels with stories written in Gospels that came along 150, 200 years after the fact. And then they will cite Hadith collections that came along 150, 200 years after the fact. And they will just leave it at that. They won't, they won't make much of an effort at explaining why it makes sense. I'm getting extra time, right? Sorry about that. That's okay. I hope everybody's alright. Let me just say this instead of what I was checking, because I can't find what I was looking for there. A good example of this, at Answering Muslims, a website I believe he belongs to, they cite that, uh, they say Muhammad, bless him, made a suicide attempt. They cite two things. They cite Ibn Ishaq and a hadith from Sahih Bukhari. But Ibn Ishaq begins his account with the words, it is recorded. Whereas Sahih Bukhari, the hadith says, uses the words, we heard. And it's plain that the source of the, the first part of the chain of narration, Aisha herself, did not use, why would she have said, we heard? That's not words you expect her to use. She was Muhammad's wife, Muhammad was. Obviously, that's the narrator himself speaking. It is recorded, we heard. Imagine that's, imagine how Snopes would treat that. Snopes, the website's uh, premier source on assessing urban legends. Maybe the world's premier source. How did you know this happened? 
We heard. So you see, you've got to be careful how you assess it. All right, he said, Muhammad, listen, and God, praise him, are regarded as partners. The Quran says, it depicts every prophet right on down through the ages as saying the same thing. He's sent to his people and he says to them, worship God and obey me. I don't see why you can't interpret this in light of that. It means that they have to do what he says, but that's because he is expressing the messages, the revelations given to him by God. Praise him. Now, a lot of what he said seems to be centered on one single choice of words that I used in my Trinity article, which the word formless. I said, you can't give a formless thing a form, just one choice of words, which may have been a bit of a careless choice of words, I admit. You know, maybe we will see God, praise Him, in heaven. But I, my main point was about iconography, about icons, using icons. That's what I was trying to express. The rest isn't nearly as important. It's not about whether He literally has a form or not. It's about, whether, it's about using icons. That's, the, that's what I was trying to express with that sentence. I right, see here. It says science did not originate from Islam. That's a, not only is that a bold and very inaccurate uh, blanket statement there, there was actually a recent trending topic when people abundantly gave examples. I think it was called Sorry for Algebra. I believe you got glass from Islamic people in the Middle Ages. We have glass because of them. They invented that. I, that's off the top of my head, though. In fact, I don't even see how that's relevant. It's focusing on people and not on doctrine. It's, if we're talking about literally the invention of science itself, it didn't originate from Christians either. But again, I don't see what difference that makes. Um, not much more in my notes here. He, just, he mainly, I admit, though, he mainly talked about the, about attributes and how and having attributes means this and having attributes means that well, everything has attributes having 99 attributes it's just, it's describing him okay, they're descriptions of the deity, praise him these are ways that we can know who he is and the trinity on the other hand you know, I almost wonder I, I do kind of wonder at times if the doctrines of the Trinity and the hypostatic union were actually invented so that people could have an out whenever, in no contrary evidence that you ever give them. There is no argument, there is no passage you can cite that will ever convince. If, I think we all know in our hearts that if you ever said to a, if there had been a passage in the Gospels in which Jesus had, bless him, had actually uttered the words, I am not God, then Christianity would still be very much as it is today. And if you pointed to that passage, the Christian would say, obviously this is one of the passages emphasizing his humanity, whereas other passages emphasize his divinity. You don't understand the Trinity. He is both perfect God and perfect man. Can you honestly not imagine that happening? <clears throat> Anthony, for his 11-minute response, all right, thank you again, Andrew. Uh, in my case against Muhammad as a prophet, I gave three, I addressed three general issues. Number one, Muhammad's God, Muhammad's book, and Muhammad himself. I tried to show that in each of these ways, the uh, Islamic religion undermines itself. Its own presuppositions are violated in every case, and even as understood by Andrew. Now, Andrew claims that he didn't understand me very much, and I'll happily grant that to him. But then let's observe that he hasn't refuted me, unless, of course, I haven't spoken intelligibly. But he didn't prove that. He couldn't have proved that, because he didn't understand me, so he couldn't have been responding to me in any intelligent fashion. Here's what I said, and he, he pretends that this is just gobbledygook. I pointed out that according to his religion, according to him, his interpretation of Surah 4171, Allah is absolutely one, as opposed to the doctrine of the Trinity, which he admits is not a belief that God is three separable deities, 
but a God who exists in himself in a tri-personal fashion. He's a unity, a diversity of persons and attributes in one essence, nature, or being. He claims that is sure, that is polytheism, mitigated polytheism, because it attributes something more than that God is simply one. You can't attribute things to him. Those are his words. But that's what you're doing when you attribute things to God. And don't just hear it from me. That this is actually, he, he actually bought that as if it's not a very rational thing. Well, let's pretend that it's not a, a conclusive argument. I think it's absolutely conclusive. But per, let's pretend that it's not. This doesn't mean that it's not rational. It's not at least an intelligent objection. In fact, there were a group of Muslims, the most dominant party in Islam from the 8th to 10th centuries, the Muatazali, who actually argued this point. It was the Mu'tazili who pointed out that if Allah is absolutely one, then he has no attributes. Now let me, let me uh, quote for you what Hamza Yusuf, who would probably be uh, respected by my opponent, what Hamza Yusuf said about the Mu'tazili. He said the Mu'tazila synthesized a complex theology that, while grounded in the Quran, was heavily influenced by Hellenistic rationalism. So these guys are rationalists. Okay? Logic with a vengeance was their theme. At its simplest level, their creed involved five fundamentals. The first was unity, by which the Mu'atizalim meant more than simply the unity or tawhid that Sunni Muslims understood. One God as opposed to many. The Mu'atizala insisted that God, God's attributes had no existence distinguishable from his essence. Okay? And then he goes on for the Mu'atizala, the affirmation on the part of those who say that God has attributes. For the Mu'atizala, this affirmation of hypostatic attributes approximated the orthodox Christian argument of a triune God. Those are Hamza Yusuf's words, an orthodox Sunni Muslim. He points out that the rationalists in the history of Islam observed that if you're going to be true to your own definition of oneness over and against the doctrine of the Trinity, then you must deny that your God has attributes. And it's also uh, something I quoted from Muhammad Asad. I'm not out on my limb here. The, the dominant party in the early centuries of Islam, 8th to 10th centuries, all the way down to the famed translator of the Quran, Muhammad Asad, all of them taught that that is what oneness means. And it contradicts what Muhammad taught about Allah having a plurality of attributes. If you tell me I can't say three persons in one God, I tell you you can't have a God who has multiple attributes. When he compares himself to his God, by the way, it's another way of committing shirk in his own religion. Notice he says, I have a bunch of attributes. Yes, you do. He has five separate fingers, right? Hand, you cut his hand off, he'd still be there, right? He has all kinds of parts, right? He's not absolutely one. That's supposed to be the analogy of his God. His God is like that. But the Quran says that his God is not comparable to anything. Surah 42, 11, right? There's nothing like him, nothing that can be compared to him. He just compared his God to himself to try and defend him against my criticism. I think that's devastating. We didn't hear him say anything about the Quran. The Quran is supposed to be eternal. He told us it's not Allah. Okay, uh, what is it? Is it inside of his deity or outside of his deity? If outside of his deity, it's an eternal existing thing outside of his God. If inside of his God, then his God is not only one. Right? What would you say if I said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God? Right? He calls that mitigated monotheism. So by his own criteria, and, and his God says that his God is one over and against that idea. Right? So that's a, he's violating his own criteria as a Muslim for affirming that his God is not purely one. His God is not absolutely one. My God is, well, uh, again, uh, that's not the topic of debate. Um, as far as Muhammad, what did he do here? He criticized uh, my methodology. He told us that the Hadith is a patchwork. I guess he's got a documentary hypothesis going on with this Hadith as well. Right? Not only can't you trust the Bible because it's a hodgepodge of sources, but so likewise, Islam's traditions by which they interpret the Quran are a hodgepodge of sources that you can't trust. Contradictory material placed side by side. Isn't that what he said? Right? Uh, now, did you hear him tell us, well, I gave, he, he criticized me because I brought these sources up and I didn't give you proof that these are valid sources. I only quoted a, a mujahid, a mujahid al-Tabari, al-Kurtabi. Who did he quote? To overturn those stalwarts of Islamic uh, theology and scholarship. I, I'm assuming he recognizes their credentials. He quoted no one in opposition to them. Besides that, the kinds of material that I'm talking to you about is mass narrated. And it's sound, according to a uh, multitude of scholars. So we really haven't heard anything from him. He complained that I brought up the issue of science. How much time do I have? He complained. I, I, Five minutes. Uh, he obviously didn't understand the problem of saying that his God is devoid of attributes, which follows from their ver version of God's oneness. Okay? To say that his God is undefinable, unknowable, impersonal, 
indistinguishable from the non-existent, is to say that his deity, at best, is an arbitrary, fickle being. He doesn't act according to a consistent nature. Right? That's what I was getting at. And I said that's why Islam did not give rise to science. He says that's just silly because Islam had this little, what was it, glass, glass invention, I guess. Uh, and he said, well, Christianity didn't give us science either. I beg to differ. Uh, and by the way, making glass is not science. Okay? Uh, but here's what Stanley Jackie, uh, or, or let me first quote uh, Edward Grant, who was a giant of scholarly achievement in the realm of uh, the history of science. He said, and I quote, it is indisputable that modern science emerged in the 17th century in Western Europe and nowhere else. Western Europe, Christian Europe. That's from his book, The Nature of Natural Philosophy in the Late Middle Ages. As well, Stanley Jackie, another authority on the history of science, said the history of science with its several stillbursts, he's referring to the fact that initially these Groups of people will start trying to do something and then it just falls apart. He says that these several stillbirths and only one viable birth okay, clearly shows that the only cosmology or view of the cosmos as a whole that was capable of generating science was a view of which the principal disseminator was the gospel itself. These are historians on science. Okay, scientists today may not like what Christians believe, but the fact is their own discipline is a deliverance of Christianity. They have science because of Christianity. So Christ, science may be playing the prodigal, but hey, it's our prodigal. Okay? And we invite him to come home. <laughs> well, uh, with all of this said, uh, again, the Islamic deity undermines itself. It's not consistent with its own standards. These cannot be the revelations of a prophet. He doesn't only contradict the Bible, he contradicts his own teachings. Now, Andrew read a lengthy passage from the Quran. I'm going to conclude this debate reading a lengthy passage from the Apostle John. Here's what the Apostle John says. In uh, chapter 2, verse 14, or I'll start in verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. And also it's lost, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it might be shown that they are not all of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let this teaching abide with you. Um, Muhammad contradicted that message, and he also contradicted his own. And I submit to you that the reason he contradicted himself and the Bible is because he wasn't speaking from the true God. The God who declared himself to be our Father through Christ and to have forgiven our sins. Muhammad was uh, not proclaiming a deity like that. His deity was not a father. He did not have a son. He does not adopt us as his children. And he cannot offer us as freely that forgiveness of sins that comes about only through Jesus and his death on the cross. And I would call Andrew and all other Muslims to put their trust in him as their only hope in life and in death. I mean, just simply what influenced you to no longer be a uh, devout Christian? You know, at the time, I couldn't have told you. I literally just woke up inspired to turn to Islam, but I didn't immediately do it. I looked into it and made sure. But then I became an apostate, and I came back to it through more of an intellectual process. Christian. What is it about Christian? How do you get a Christian? Whatever. That's, that is a good question. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe devout isn't a word anyone should be quick to attribute to themselves or to anybody else. In the end, there is only one who, who knows these things, isn't it? Who knows the depths of our intentions. But I, let us say that I was ardent. 
do Muslims today still claim ancestry from the line of Ishmael? If so, then does this not make them the son of Abraham and also the brother to the ancestors of the Jews? It is uh, Arabs who are descended from Ishmael. Listen, not all Muslims are. As for the whole brethren thing, according to Strong's Concordance, the word has a very broad meaning. It, I think the, I can't remember the exact words, but it's something like it's used in its broadest sense, both literally and metaphorically. What would you say are other or the most standard arguments that Muslims give for the prophethood of, of Muhammad? I did mention that Muhammad himself, this, this would be what I would be most interested in, in terms of assessing an argument. Uh, is what did Muhammad think was persuasive? What did he think was a genuine argument for his religion? What did he tell people to look to as proof that he was a prophet? Uh, all the stuff that other people are coming up with would only show me that these people are creative, they have a lot of ingenuity, uh, but if their proof wasn't his proof, what he had confidence in, then I don't know that I should even care about those other things. Right? Maybe those other things would be interesting to me if, first, the, uh, Muhammad's argument was given fair play. But Muhammad's argument was that the Quran is inimitable, that it is eloquent, and it surpasses any other work of literature. Uh, and there's I mean, a lot more to that. Andrew would certainly not think that what I just said is adequate description of all that. And there's a lot more. You can look into it. Look into what Muslims say. I just don't find the Quran to be what it claims to be. And I don't care if it's super eloquent, if it teaches mass confusion, if it teaches falsehoods about God, about Christ, about man, about my salvation, about how I can have a hope for heaven or not. Uh, that, you know, he, you just mentioned, nobody can know if they're saved, for example, only Allah knows that. Obviously, I would grant that only God knows fully everything, but the Bible tells us that we can know. The same book of 1 John that tells us that his prophet was Antichrist, right? That same book says these things were written to you so that you might know that you have eternal life, okay? These are radically different messages, radical di uh, different religions. They lead to radically different cultures, radical different personal piety. Uh, you can see that. Look at our world. They're very different. And I, I'm, I can tell you quite honestly, I'd rather live in the Christian world than in the one produced by Muhammad. Uh, I'm basically, what I'm asking is how can Allah justify the wicked? The Quran says that for he who believes, God will guide his heart aright. Maybe we've all sinned, but he, he is willing to forgive your sins even if they are piled as high as heaven. Whether that hadith is correct or not, it is certainly in line with the teaching of the Quran. I don't see. I've never been, I just do not understand why anyone should have to be crucified in order for our sins to be forgiven. Forgiveness is as simple as, please forgive me, and I forgive you. What happened to those sins that that particular sinner committed? What happens to the sin is a type of choice. What happened to them is that they're in the past, and now they're forgiven. You see, I guess what you're, this is this, that I, this is that I think you're think you're going into that old misconception that there's that the argument that justice and mercy are on this scale you absolutely you need to some kind of outside intervention in order to get them together because it's just uh, you can't fit them together it doesn't work that way there's, there's nothing mutually exclusive here I just I've never been able to grasp that kind of thought there's nothing unjust about forgiving someone when they do wrong, you have the option of punishing them, and if they are genuinely repentant, it's not unfair to forgive them. In fact, you might say it's unfair not to, if that's their intention. Does the Bible have any root or foundation uh, in Islam or Allah? And if so, um, can Allah's word be corrupted? Okay, the Quran speaks of there being four, it speaks of four previous revelations. It, at first, there were the scrolls of Abraham. Said, we don't know anything about that. It's like when the Bible mentions the books of Je the book of Jasher, the writings of Ido. This happens in a secular world a lot. Book, the references to books that are now lost. Then the Torah, or the law, literally the Torah. And the book of Psalms, it mentions only them get, being given to David. Bless him and then the Gospel, those are the four it mentions. These were given from above. As for being corrupted, the Quran, I could be wrong about this, the Quran says that uh, if something is truly the Word of God, it will not be changed, but it also says that people have written scripture with their own hands and claimed that it was divinely inspired when it wasn't. 
So you can forge scripture. You can write things that are passed off as divinely inspired. Of course, the modern word in biblical scholarship is a pseudepigraphy. Because when we say it's forgery, people get all sort. There are all sorts of negative connotations that oversimplify the intentions, and it's some, maybe the text. The situation is more complicated than that, and it also doesn't deny that text can be retroactively called divinely inspired when that was never the author's intentions, as is the case with the canonical gospels. They never meant for it to be depicted that way. They never meant for it to be seen that way. So I think I think that answers your question, doesn't it? I believe so. Uh, this is where you can applaud both gentlemen for their... Uh...